Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Literacy in the Disciplines July webinar. We have been presenting a series of webinars since February on content area and disciplinary literacy and learning. And the purpose of these webinars have been to educate those who work with students across various disciplines at the middle school and high school level in helping them to acquire the knowledge that they need to think and to speak and to read and to write in that discipline. Our purpose as educators is to really support teachers across all levels. As I mentioned, we are from uh, universities across the state of South Carolina, and our goal is to help teachers feel confident in their knowledge and their skill set as they work with and educate their students. We believe that teachers who are confident and teachers who have self-efficacy will be effective in helping students acquire the discipline, the, the skills that they need and the knowledge that they need in their discipline. I should have mentioned before that we are funded by the South Carolina Middle Grades Initiative and we are grateful to them for their continued support of this organization. We come from across the state of South Carolina. As you can see here, we are a very diverse group and we bring different skill sets to the table. And collectively, we have been publishing and sharing information and presenting at conferences to help educators strengthen their skills. Currently, we are a group of six active members, and we're excited to continue to support educators in South Carolina and across the region. I am Kevin Ming. I am a faculty member at Winthrop University, and I have been thrilled to be with this group for the past two and a half years. Today, my topic is on providing access to content area learning. So I'll tell you a little bit about how this webinar came into a play. So I've been teaching content area literacy at the graduate and the undergraduate level for the past 14 years. And there's a basic premise that I have had in my mind and that I have shared with students. And it is that students who participate in content area instruction, they do have some level of literacy, cognitive and physical skills to effectively navigate the content and to engage in content area learning. Basically, I've told my students that in the earlier grades, students learn how to read and in the later grades, in fourth grade, fifth grade and above, they're using literacy as a tool to help them access content. And technically that information is correct. However, there were some fundamental principles that I did not pay close attention to until I had a moment in the spring, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So my focus on differentiation, and I am special education trained, and so I, I taught my students about differentiation, but my primary focus in teaching about differentiation really stemmed from the point of acquiring content. So the differentiation that I talked about, the differentiation that I emphasized, focused on helping students to, to learn the information, to comprehend, which is the ultimate goal of learning and of understanding. So things that I talked about in my class, both at the graduate and the undergraduate level included um, activities like using grade level texts that are, um, lower for struggling readers and writing, writers, excuse me, providing opportunities for students to collaborate with peers, um, looking at strategies, modeling strategies for students, adapting strategies for diverse learners, using a variety of uh, texts, pairing informational texts with fictional texts in order for students to be able to grasp the concept and you know the concepts that they were learning. And they, those were excellent strategies However, something happened in the spring of 2022. And I call this a moment of awakening. So we started to work with a group of MAT teaching assistants who were working on getting their special education degree. And in the past, I have had 
teachers who worked with special education students, but I never had a group, a full group, a cohort of special education MAT students. But I had this group in the spring of 2022 in my graduate level course. And the course started, the course was progressing, the first few days of the course happened, and then I began to get comments such as the following. You know, I work, Dr. Mean, with students who are nonverbal, students who are non-readers, students who have low vision, students who have fine motor deficits, students who have cognitive disabilities. And the differentiation and the strategies that I taught in the past were not sufficient for this group. So I needed to think outside of the box. I needed to find some other supports to make the content meaningful for their students. Because if we talked about a traditional reading or writing strategy and students did not have the reading skills in place or did not have the cognitive skills in place, then the strategy was not very effective. So I had to dig a little bit deeply in this spring semester to look beyond the cognitive, which was the focus in the past, to look at other ways to develop both cognitive and physical abilities so that all students could be included in content area reading and writing and just general content area learning. So the focus for me needed to be on providing access to students with extensive support needs. And so that's the piece that I believe was missing from prior semesters and prior years. It was for students who needed more intensive support, students who needed, who had more um, extensive support needs. And so I really had to do a little bit of research to go beyond what I had been doing in the past. So here I want you to think about, you know, what are the groups of learners that you work with in your academic contexts? Are your practices fully supporting their learning experiences? So think about the strategies that you're using, the techniques that you're using. Are you meeting the needs of all of your learners? Just take a, a little while to think about what are you doing and is it adequate? Is it sufficient for your student population? So just a little bit of background on special education services since the group in the context of this discussion are special education students. So the goal, one goal of special education is to enable students with disabilities to make progress in the same grade level curriculum to the greatest extent possible as their peers. So we want our special education students to our students with disabilities to have access to grade level curriculum that their peers in the general education classroom are experiencing. And we call this access the least restrictive environment. And there is the IDEA law that requires students who have disabilities to be educated in what we call the least restrictive environment. In other words, students with disabilities should not be removed from the general education setting simply because there's modification that is needed to the general education curriculum. So it is the responsibility of educators to provide the access, to provide the modifications that are essential to ensure that students with disabilities, students in special education um, classrooms have opportunities to interact with their general education peers. We are moving to more inclusive um, educational context, inclusive classrooms where students with disabilities are being educated in the general education setting, which is a positive thing because we want children to be interacting with and engaging with and learning from their peers to the greatest extent possible. So the rule idea, the law idea does require students to be placed in least restrictive environments. In many cases, this is the general education setting. So teachers must use what we call modifications and or accommodations. These are terms that are used in the special education world uh, to, to demonstrate a change, a tweak um, to, to what's being provided, to the curriculum, to the setting, 
to the requirements of students. It's a way of making content and learning accessible to individuals with disabilities. So we'll talk a little bit about what a modification is and what an accommodation is as we look at our strategies today. So an accommodation, an accommodation, it allows students to participate in the same kinds of learning experiences and assessments as their peers. So we're talking about minor changes to the curriculum. Students are being held to the same standards as their general education peers and things like the timing, the formatting, the setting of the, the lesson, the context in which students are learning the lesson may be altered, but there is no significant alteration to the core content. So students are learning what their general education peers are learning, but tweaks, um, some, some sorts of minor changes we could call it are being made to allow students with disabilities to have access to the content that their peers have access to. And some examples of the um, accommodations include things like using assistive technology, and we'll talk about assistive technology this afternoon, providing texts in alternate formats such as Braille. So if we have a student who has a visual impairment, who is blind, the student would be provided with an alternate text, larger print or Braille to make the accommodation for them, providing alternate forms for long written assignments. So allowing students to, to demonstrate their learning in alternative ways other than writing, such as an oral presentation would be an example of an accommodation. Using daily or frequent grading so that we are keeping track of student progress daily and we're averaging multiple scores to enable students to be as successful as possible. A modification is a more significant adjustment to the curriculum and it may require for the standards to be changed or modified or the standards, the requirements are adapted a little bit so that students can still learn to their greatest extent possible. So it does adjust the standard or the criteria that students must achieve. Examples of modifications, which is a little bit more extensive, include providing, um, includes providing alternative books with similar concepts. So helping students who are um, struggling readers or writers, they can access alternative books. So they're learning the gist of the topic, but they may not be reading the same on grade level text as their peers. Shortening assignments to focus on key concepts. So again, students are work, walking away with um, the general information, the gist, the core ideas, but they may not be held to every single element of the standard that the general education student is being held to. Um, another example of a modification includes using a partial grading. But we do need to recognize that placement alone is not sufficient to guarantee that students are going to be successful. Students must be engaged in activities that are correlated to their IEP objectives. General and special education teachers must work together to make sure that students with disabilities, their IEPs are being met with fidelity through the general education system. So as I looked into how to help my group of 12 MAT special education um, teacher candidates meet the expectations of the graduate class with fidelity and walk away with strategies and ideas that they can use in their special education classrooms, I came across two themes. The first theme being collaboration and the second theme being assistive technology. So in other words, I looked for ways to adapt what I was teaching in that graduate literacy course in, in bringing in strategies for collaboration and assistive technology that would help their special education students. So we'll talk first about collaboration and then um, about assistive technology. So support number one, collaboration. So simply collaboration involves bringing people together for a common purpose. That's a very uh, broad definition of collaboration. And under this construct of collaboration, it can be broken down into three smaller, more fine-tuned elements of collaboration. We can talk about collaboration with regard to collaborative planning, interprofessional collaboration, and co-teaching. 
and we'll look at three examples of how collaboration can be used to support students with disabilities in the general education context. But before we do that, think about collaboration that you have been involved in. What kinds of collaborative opportunities have you experienced? Um, has it been beneficial? Do you feel like your students benefit from collaborations with fellow colleagues? Collaboration is generally a positive thing as individuals put their ideas and their skill sets together to benefit students. And so I would encourage collaboration in your educational contexts to the greatest extent possible. So our first content area literacy example with regard to collaboration is collaborative planning. So who can collaborative planning benefit? It can basically benefit all students with a wide range of disabilities. So specifically what collaborative planning involves, it involves educators coming together with their various areas of expertise. They look at common language and instruction and they work together for a couple of reasons to help students achieve goals and objectives that are in the general education curriculum, that is in the special education curriculum, and that is on students' IEPs. So educators come together with mutual goals and objectives based on what is required of students. So here, the specific content area literacy example happens in the context of an eighth grade mathematics classroom. So in this eighth grade mathematics classroom, students must learn about radicals and integers. So the general education teacher highlights the concept of the integer and shares with the special education teacher that this word, this vocabulary word integer is foundational to the topic of integers and radical exponents. And so Mary, who is a student who has a moderate cognitive disability is in the general education classroom and the general and special education teacher review Mary's IEP to determine how does what Mary need coincide with this topic of radicals and integer exponents. So the two teachers determine that Mary needs to learn about the concept of integer and an integer, it is a whole number. Mary needs to learn about integers in real life. Mary needs to use whole numbers in real life. And so the general education teacher works with the special education teacher to determine that when Mary is in this mathematics setting, that she will be asked to identify real life integers around the classroom, real life whole numbers around the classroom. For example, the general education teacher will ask Mary to read the temperature on the thermostat and to state whether the number indicates that the classroom is hot, the classroom is warm, or the classroom is cold. So in this example, Mary, who has a cognitive disability, is in a general education setting uh, with her peers. The concept is on integers, and it can be practically applied to Mary's need to work with integers in real life context. So the teacher, the general education teacher, will have specific and predetermined stopping points in the lesson to pull Mary in where she's being asked to, to look for integers in the classroom and use integers in these in real life contexts. Example number two, it's interprofessional collaboration. And in this collaborative model, providers bring specific areas of expertise to solve a problem. Now, who can interprofessional collaboration support? It can support all learners, but in this specific example, we're looking at students with physical disabilities that affect their gross motor skills. So the context of this content area example is in an 11th grade physical education swim class. So this is physical education, it's 11th grade. The swim coach brings the swim standards rubric to the physical education, excuse me, the physical education swim coach brings the rubric, the general education swim standards to the special education 
teacher to determine how the rubric can be adapted to support students with physical disabilities. So an example of a standard requirement for the general education population is to fully participate in three rounds of swimming drills to practice good technique. Now this would be adapted for students who have disabilities. They need to practice good technique uh, just a few more times than the general education students. So they would participate in five rounds of swim drills to practice good technique. And this may sound punitive in nature, but it's not punitive for the students who have physical disabilities because they have to develop and practice technique a little bit more. They are required to, to do a few more rounds of drills. Now, another example that's not necessary, that's not here on the screen would be if students uh, a student has a physical disability and they have one instead of two legs, for example, it could be adapted where the students must swim um, using motion with one leg instead of two legs in order to make the appropriate laps in the pool. So it's looking for ways in this specific example to accommodate for students who have a physical disability. So the swim teacher, the PE swim teacher will work with the special education teacher to look at how a rubric for uh, the swim criteria can be adapted for a student with a physical disability. The third example is interprofessional collaboration. And in this model, teachers work and instruct together to ensure the least restrictive environment for students. And again, this particular strategy can work with a wide range of students with disabilities. In this example, we have a seventh grade art classroom. And the objective in this lesson is for students to demonstrate their ability to construct an object using sculpting techniques. So students must demonstrate their ability to construct using sculpting. Now the special education teacher working in this art classroom could support a variety of students with disabilities in doing several things. The special education teacher could work with students to interpret a reduced set of instructions. So if the art teacher provides a list of instructions, the special education teacher could work to peer that list down in advance. I think the, the, the set of instructions would be, would be peered down in advance and the special education teacher would work with those students in the art classroom to interpret a lesser uh, set of instructions. The special education teacher could also explain the art teacher's language um, clarifying uh, any nuances that are used. The special education teacher could help the students with disabilities in this art context to set up any necessary equipment. The special education teacher could provide hand over hand assistance if that level of intense modeling um, is needed for special education students. So these are just three examples of how general and special education teachers can work together to support special education students in the general education classroom context. We'll talk now about support number two, which is assistive technology. So assistive technology pretty much refers to any device, any equipment, any system that helps students to bypass or compensate for learning and or physical challenges. So these are tools that students use to navigate their learning contexts. It allows individuals to reach their full potential and it allows them to capitalize on their strengths and bypass any areas of difficulty. Assistive technology should be used in conjunction with other forms of remediation to improve students' performance. And by that, I mean that while we're using assistive technology, if there are ways to strengthen student skills so that they won't have the need for assistive technology, that should be happening simultaneously. As students are using this assistive technology, they are also working to remediate specific 
in, in this case, it would be specific academic skills or even motor skills. They could be working to get whatever therapies they need in order to move away from the need of assistive technology. Now we do recognize that assistive technology will be needed for some students for an extended period of time, and that is absolutely okay. But for those students who can move away from assistive technology with remediation, that remediation should absolutely be in place to support them. So think about assistive technology used with students with disabilities or diverse populations. Have you seen assistive technology used? What kinds of technology have you seen? Has it worked? Have you seen students move away from assistive technology because of re remediation? So in other words, what is your experience with assistive technology and had it, has it been proven to be effective. So take a, a few moments to, to think about how assistive technology has played a role in your specific academic context. So the examples here, we have three examples again, like we had with collaboration. The first example is a speech recognition software. And there are many examples of, of speech recognition software that exists. But the example here that I'm using is the uh, Dragon Naturally speaking software. So who can benefit from this? Students with physical disabilities that affect fine motor skills, students with learning disabilities. This can be used with several populations. So what is it and how does it work? So speech recognition software, it translates spoken words into text to enable students to participate in the learning experience. Students will need a device, and in three examples that I'll be providing, students will need software devices, so that is something that they would have to access either on their own or through their schools, whether it is an, an iPad, some other, um, a laptop, or some other tablet that would allow them to engage because they will need something on which the um, software is downloaded on. So once the software is downloaded, onto students' devices. They use a microphone to speak into Word documents, as well as other applications. PDFs, for example, can be used with um, speech recognition software. And as students speak into the microphone, the words appear on the screen as if they're being typed. So if students have limitations in typing, the speech recognition software is a great tool to allow them to be able to demonstrate their learning, to show what they know or to produce without having to physically either type or use a pen or a pencil. The content area example here is in a 10th grade US history class. Students are learning about the American Revolution, and we know that journal writing is a wonderful way for students to demonstrate their understanding, demonstrate their processing. So in this example, the teacher is using an I Wonder journal, and students are supposed to respond to the prompt on the American Revolution, something that they wonder about with regard to the American Revolution. So a student who is using a speech recognition software would speak their thoughts into this device to demonstrate to the teacher that they have thoughts about the American Revolution. The second example of an assistive technology, it's text, text to speech program. And Kurzweil is an example. Again, there are many examples of text-to-speech programs, but the example that I'm using here is Kurzweil. Who can benefit from text-to-speech programs? Struggling readers, students who are blind or who have low vision, students with phys physical disabilities, and a whole host of other students. So what is it and how does it work? It artificially produces human speech through a computerized system. And again, students would need a device once they have downloaded the software on their device and they have gone through the necessary setup, either the teacher or the student would scan the Word or the PDF file or the internet pages into this program, and the students would listen to and, if possible, 
read along with the reader. So students are able to, to listen to instead of having to read on their own, if they have a disability that prevents them or if they're a struggling reader, they would have access to the content as the, the peers in the class. The content example here is a ninth grade English language arts classroom. So students here are reading A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. And either the teacher or the student uploads the selected page, selected pages of the day's reading. And the student is able to listen and follow along while other peers may be actually reading the text. Select students may be listening to the text. And after the entire class reads the selected pages, the teacher engages in a turn and talk. So the students who have uh, disabilities are able to engage in the turn and talk because they have now had access to the content because they were able to, to listen to the text on this text to speech program. And students are able, students with disabilities are able to, to share their input, to give their thoughts on the text due to the enabled access through speech recognition software. The third example of assistive technology is what we call e-texts. Who can benefit from e-texts? Students with visual impairments, struggling readers, students with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and a whole host of other students, as I said before. So what is it and how does it work? An e-text, it's any document that is mainly text and available in a digital format. Now, and I'll talk a little bit about the differences between an audiobook and an e-text. So in e-text, the materials can be displayed in custom color combinations. It can be, the fonts can be changed, the sizes can be changed. Um, E-text include features that allow, allow the text to be highlighted as it's being read. It enables an entire text to be read automatically. S designated sections of a text can be um, read automatically. It offers study features. It offers lookup features. It offers word definition features. So students access the text either independently through their school systems. And again, they do have to download these materials on a digital device. An e-text, it's a little bit more interactive in nature than an audiobook. Audiobooks are typically only audio in nature and the reader listens to the audiobook. E-texts provide both visual and audio input and students are able to engage with e-texts. So audiobooks would be great in the classroom as well but e-texts are a little bit more engaging. Students can do more with, interact with, and use, actively use e-texts. Now, there are many places to find e-texts. Um, Ebooks.com, Amazon.com, OpenLibrary.org, or Epic.com are examples of places that provide e-texts for, for teachers and learners. The content area example here, it's a sixth grade science class, and the teacher is using the EPIC reading platform to reinforce the topic of meteors. Now, there are designated interactive books called read to me in the EPIC program, and in the read to me books, they enable students to actively engage with the text as they listen to the selection. So to activate knowledge, the teacher could identify the spotlight words. So again, in this epic, there are spotlight words from the text. And the teacher could have students do a little bit of a rating survey to see how much they remember, or how much they have learned from the discussion on meteors. Students can use signal paddles. If they're non-communicative, if they're non-verbal, they could use signal paddles to show what their response is to the knowledge rating survey. And after this before reading activity, the teacher could follow up with a, maybe a reteach or an initial mini lesson. And then in order to reinforce the concept, students listen to the text, to this read to me text while reading on the screen. So they can see the words being highlighted as they read on the screen and the words are enlarged. So they're made big and they can actually be highlighted as 
they are being read. Interesting facts are provided on each page for students in this read uh, to me selection in Epic. Questions are asked along the way, and there's even a quiz at the end to measure students' level of understanding. So it's a great tool for teachers to use to really help solidify content. Students listen to the books, they interact with the books, they do follow-up discussions, they do quizzes at the end. So e-texts are wonderful for initial teaching or for reinforcement. So those were six strategies across middle school and high school. And this was just a snippet in terms of helping educators to see how they can enable all students access to their content. The two examples here were collaboration and assistive technology. And there are many other strategies that teachers within collaboration and assistive technology that teachers can employ to ensure that all students, even those with more intensive needs, we, we wanna make sure that all students have access to the content. We wanna make sure that all students can be educated in the least restrictive environment. We want to make sure that students have access to content and learning across both physical and cognitive aspects. Again, my learning experience was to, to move away from more of the cognitive to include more physical, physical activities, physical strategies that can support those students who have disabilities that are somewhat more intense than just a student with a learning disability or a student who is a struggling reader. We wanted, you know, I needed to learn more about a greater um, extent to access. A general and special education teachers must work to accommodate and modify instruction and student responses to ensure them opportunities for engagement. We wanna make sure that we are providing accommodations and modifications. Sometimes only an accommodation is needed, a slight tweak to the curriculum, to the way in which things are being done. Sometimes a more extensive change which is a modification is needed to ensure that students are accessing content. Two ways to include this group as discussed today are through collaboration and assistive technology. We wanna be inclusive of all learners. We wanna make sure that we're meeting the needs, the various needs of all learners to make sure that students are benefiting from the curriculum. Thank you everyone for listening to this presentation today. Again, I'm Kevin Ming. I am at Winthrop University. If you have questions about what was presented here, please feel free to reach out to me and I'll be happy to follow up uh, to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you everyone and have a great rest of your day.